So 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we're going to read 12 verses this morning. For you yourselves know, brothers and sisters, about our coming to you. It is not proven to be purposeless. But although we suffered earlier and were mistreated in Philippi, and we'll talk about that in a moment, as you know, we had the courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of much opposition. Verse 3, For the appeal we make does not come from error or impurity or with deceit, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we declare it not to please people, but God, who examines our hearts. For we never appeared with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is our witness. Nor to seek glory from people, either from you or from any others. Verse 7, although we could have imposed our weight as apostles of Christ, instead we became little children among you, like a nursing mother caring for her own children. With such affection for you, we were happy to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. For you recall, brothers and sisters, our toil and drudgery by working night and day, so as not to impose a burden on any of you, we preach to you the gospel of God. You've heard that three times now. Verse 10, you are witnesses, and so is God, as to how holy and righteous and blameless our conduct was toward you who believe. As you know, we treated each one of you as a father treats his own children, exhorting and encouraging you and insisting that you live in a way worthy of God who calls you to his own kingdom and his glory. May God bless the reading of his word. Well, by now in the news, you've already heard of Pastor James Coates from Alberta, Canada. This Canadian pastor who refused to comply with public health orders during the pandemic spent a month in jail before being released on Monday. And this is an article from March 23rd. James Coates pleaded guilty to breaching bail and was issued a fine of $1,500 with his time spent in prison counting as credit for the fine. CBC News reported his congregation, Grace Life Church, has continued to meet for Sunday worship without complying with the province's restrictions around capacity, masks, and social distancing. Coates defended his stance before the judge saying, and I quote, I'm simply here in obedience to Jesus Christ. And it's my obedience to Christ that has put me at odds with the law. The court is aware that I'm contesting the legitimacy, I'm, I'm not contesting the legitimacy of the law, but please make no mistake, I'm not trying to make a point. I'm not a political revolutionary. Pastor Coates said the government needs to be informed of its God-ordained purpose and that people have a responsibility to ensure leaders understand it is the church that is the pillar of truth, end quote. And in his sermon, Pastor Coates noted that the reason we are to be subject to the governing authorities is because all authority is from God. That means all authority originates with God, which means all authority is delegated authority, and that means the governing authorities are accountable to who? God. In other words, the governing authorities have a stewardship, a mandate from God in His holy word, for it's they will be judged. They are not, they are not autonomous. They are not sovereign. They are servants of God. By meeting, we're testifying the government has no jurisdiction here in the church, not with regard to our worship, by simply being open and by garnering the intention we have, which is not our choice, but it has come upon us. We believe we're showing the government they overstepped their authority 
regardless of whether their excuse is a so-called pandemic or not. And so by obeying Christ in this way, the government is being forced to consider what their authority actually is. Pastor Coates noted that if a government realizes they are accountable to God, which all governments are, but choose to restrict religious freedoms, they are suppressing the truth of the Bible. How many governments actually know that they are accountable to God? Probably zero. Do you think our government knows it's accountable to God in America? Not likely. And if it does, it is suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. Coates then said that if the church refuses to fulfill her role and function, then she is walking in negligence. I'm doing what I am doing in obedience to Christ, notes Coates. The pastor is scheduled to go to trial sometime in May for the one remaining charge of violating COVID-19 guidelines on gathering size. Now, if you haven't heard about Pastor Coates, you probably have heard about Dr. John MacArthur. California fights with Governor Gavin. Grace Community Church, their leadership has engaged in an intensifying battle with government officials ever since the state reinstituted gathering bans in response to a resurgence of COVID-19 cases. Pastor John MacArthur and his board filed a lawsuit on Wednesday seeking to block the state of California from enforcing Governor Gavin Newsom's order banning indoor worship in the state's most populous counties, including Los Angeles County, where Grace Community is located. The congregation has met for the last four or five Sundays now in defiance of that order. The 46-page complaint accuses the Democratic governor and other state and county health officials of wide-ranging constitutional violations. It draws special attention to the way government officials encouraged recent mass protests while barring indoor church gatherings and singing and praying and calling it blatant favoritism. The Los Angeles County Attorneys sent MacArthur a cease to desist letter threatening fines up to a thousand a day and imprisonment if his church didn't stop gathering for worship indoors. After Grace Community Church voluntarily complied with state orders, as many of us did for nearly six months, California's edicts demanding an indefinite shutdown have gone now far past rational or reasonable and are firmly in the territory of tyranny and discrimination, said Jenna Ellis, special counsel for the Thomas More Society, which represents the church. This isn't about health, she said. It's about blatant targeting of churches. Well, why did I take the time to tell you about Pastor Coates and Dr. John MacArthur? Because our passage today caught my eye in verse 2, which I said I'd come back to in just a moment. And it caught my eye for this weekend. And I'd like to read verse 2 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 one more time. But although we suffered earlier and were mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of much opposition. Folks, now is the time to check in, not to check out. Boldness for Christ and the gospel is necessary. There's a story of St. Paul's arrest here in this passage his beating and imprisonment at Philippi that serves as a kind of paradigm for the radicalism of true Christianity and why it so perturbs many people today. Have you ever wondered that? Why does it bother any government of how we consciously worship? Why does that bother anybody that 
in our own consciousness, we made a Christian decision of whether we want to wear a mask or not wear a mask, gather or not gather, we've left that totally to the consciousness of every individual to make their own choice, as it should be. I think that's freedom. If you want to wear a mask, wear a mask. If you want to segregate, segregate. So I thought it fascinating today that long before Pastor Coates and long before John MacArthur faced their first opposition, ever since Pentecost, the church has been facing enemies. Now, I don't know what that means to you, but I know what it means to me. For of itself, the Christian faith, its message, and the transformation it can affect is very unsettling for a world that quite literally and figuratively banks on sin. The world loves its own. Remember what the Father said. If you love the world and the things of the world, the love of the Father is not in you. So let's consider this lesser-known story of the Apostle Paul and see what it ought to mean to us today if we take the Christian faith seriously and we're not trying to just simply tame it. Now, it, I never thought much about it as a kid. I never thought much about it. I, I, I grew up in a different era than where we are today. And, you know, it seems that a line a spiritual line has been drawn in the sand by God. And it's almost as if when Moses came off that holy mountain encounter with God and there was a choice that had to be made and only the Levites sided with Moses. But I think there's a spiritual line drawn not just in America but in the world today for God's trying to find out who's really his and who's just giving lip service. And that's a challenge for all of us. But Philippi, um, where Paul was persecuted, was the first European city that Paul evangelized as he came across from Asia Minor. Arriving at the port, the port of Philippi in Macedonia, Paul and Silas went right to work evangelizing, sharing their faith in the Lord. And one of their first converts was Lydia, a wealthy woman from Thyatira, a dealer in purple cloth, and then other converts followed. And here is where our story picks up. What was the persecution that Paul went through? Here's the story. Once we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune-telling. The girl followed Paul and the rest of us shouting all day long, everywhere we went, these men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, the Apostle Paul, having enough, became so troubled that he turned around and spoke to the spirit in the girl, and he said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left her. When the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was now gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews, and they're throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. Now, that's an important point I'm going to talk to you about in just a moment. Romans picked the state religion and they told you who you would worship and what was legitimate and what was not. So the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. And they had been severely flogged. And if you know anything about flogging, it deals with the bottom of your feet. They were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. And upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell fastened their feet in the stocks. And if you remember Acts 16, that passage, there was a song years ago about that. When they were in prison, they began to worship God at midnight. In the midst of their problems and troubles, they just began to praise and sing God. The next thing we know, there's an earthquake and an angel is letting them out. 
Now, that's probably hard for you to believe. I don't know if you've ever had a theophany or you've seen an angel or an encounter with one. I have not. But they did. The second thing I want you to notice in this story, I want you to notice the heart of the problem because it's the heart of the problem today in our government, in our country, in the world as well. Paul, in setting the slave girl free of her demon, has deprived her owners of the income that they derive from her sad state. They were banking on her bad condition and trafficking on her trouble. But in the name of the power of Jesus Christ, St. Paul sets her free. His action draws deep anger from the owners. He has rocked their financial world, touched their pocketbooks. They see the Christian message for it is revolutionary, disconcerting, threatening, and deeply unsettling. That is the message of the gospel that the world does not like. They won't like it. Jesus said, in the world you'll be of, uh, have trouble and persecution, but be of good cheer because I overcame the world. But he also said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. If the world likes you, I'm wondering. If the world embraces you, I'm wondering. So first, the problem that we see, like we see in the world today, it was a threat to their profit. But not only to their profit, it's a threat to their power. Governments want absolute power and control. That is not how God, in Romans 13, set up the governments and the authorities of what they're supposed to do. Did you know, and I love Pastor Coates' sermon before he was arrested, he preached on Romans 13 and expounded a great deal that it is the Bible that gives governments their role of authority on how to deal with the people. God set that up. Now, many people have misquoted Romans 13. In fact, Adolf Hitler, in persecuting the Jews, misused Romans 13 to get them to comply and submit. But there's so much ignorance in the context of the Word of God today. This is not about making the Bible say what you or I want it to say. There is a language, and Latin and Aramaic and Greek are the languages that we have been given to discern the truth of each text and to understand the fullness of the context. It's not everybody just gets to put their own opinion into the Bible, guys. That's not how God established that. In having Paul arrested, they stirred up the hatred and fear of all the others, indicating that Paul was not merely preaching some strange new religion that Rome, the government, did not approve of, but were advocating customs forbidden to all Romans. And the word customs here in the Greek is ethe, and refers to religious rites or forms of worship. So I dug a little bit. Cicero in the Le I can't say that Latin phrase, De La Gibus, chapter 2, verse 8. This is Roman law. Here's what the law stated. No person shall have any separate gods or new ones, nor shall he or she privately worship any strange gods unless they be publicly allowed by the Roman government. Did you catch that? Gods that only the Roman government would approve of. While the Romans often overlooked the private worship of unapproved gods, to publicly proclaim new and unapproved deities was an occasion for dissension and controversy, and it was forbidden. Isn't that where we are today? Isn't that what this is all about today? You don't see them persecuting Muslims. You don't see them resting imams or their rabbis or their priests. You, you, you don't see Buddhist temples being threatened and having fences put around them. You don't see Scientology having those issues other than that one actress who absolutely declared war against them. But Scientology operas, operates free in everything that they do without opposition. 
But when you look at the real Christians and these men that preach truth and preach Christ crucified, Pastor Coates in Canada, MacArthur out in California, and hundreds and hundreds of others that do it right, that seems to be where they're making their problems and their arrests. Do you remember a couple weeks back I told you that I read off things at different times and I was reading through the uh, Satanic Bible and I was curious, I was just curious what they worship and what they do. And I found a passage in there where they are told and commanded as they read to their group and the group would read back to them to blaspheme Jesus of Nazareth. Not Allah, not Buddha, not Confucius. You know why? As I told you, because we got the goods. We got it right. We have the one true God, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of all promise and hope and grace and peace and love. And by the way, if nobody else recognizes it, you bet that fallen angel, the devil, he recognizes it. He knows who's got the real deal, and that's where the persecution lies. Sure, it's a threat to profit, it's a threat to power. And the charges against Paul and Silas, okay, true enough, they preached the gospel, but they hindered human profit in the genuine healing that they, they brought to this lady. And further, they were openly proclaiming that Jesus Christ was Lord. What did you hear coming out about religions in the news over the past couple years, no religion can claim exclusivity. You understand what that means? That you won't be allowed to say that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and that nobody goes unto the Father but through him. Oh, you can't claim that. You can't claim that. That's where we are. Now, I'd love to preach some warm fuzzies about a lot of different things, guys, but this is a call to battle. It's a call to arms. Everything's sacred. This is not about cowering down. And let me tell you what I believe that the pandemic did. I think it did a lot to make us all self-centered, self-preservationist. I think it had a lot to do with looking out just for us, protecting us, protecting our family, protecting our kids, protecting our job, protecting... And that is opposite of Christianity. And I tell this story that during the Black Plague, Martin Luther, literally who was, uh, had a married, his wife was pregnant, in that plague that killed everybody roughly that it touched. We talked about this in Sunday school a little bit. I mean, COVID, many, I mean, a large number have recovered from it, you know, I went through it, our family went through it, but we recovered from it. I know some didn't, and that's extremely unfortunate. But they stayed behind, and they ministered to people. And I just never forgot that. We have the real deal. We, we have the one, the true Son of God. And this is a, a message this morning about how Paul postured himself in face of opposition. It matters because how are you going to posture yourself in opposition? Listen, we are in the great falling away that Paul warned Timothy about. In the end, many will fall away. But he never wanted any of us to be ignorant. He wanted us to be informed about what God requires. Remember the words of Jesus, if you profess me before men, I will profess you before my Father. If you denounce me before men, I will denounce you before my Father. You've got to decide, are you all in or not? You have no idea, nobody in this room Nobody around this planet knows what's coming in the future. Only God knows the future. But I think the command of Joshua to the Israelites is profound. Choose you this day who you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord.
They weren't advocating the overthrow of any government. Neither was MacArthur. Neither was Pastor Coates. They weren't advocating those things. They were just simply announcing a power greater than Caesar and a higher king demanding first loyalty, and they said, Jesus Christ is Lord. Although many governments desire supreme power, you do know only God Almighty has supreme power. Kings and queens and governments come and go, but Christ is forever. This is not the tame and domesticated proclamation of the faith so common today. This is not the faith that is trimmed to fit into worldly categories and to be tucked under political, philosophical, and moral preferences. This is about a faith that shakes the world and brings a revolutionary challenge to the world's priorities. And Paul and Silas were a serious threat. What about you? Is it okay that we're so busy about our livelihood, our jobs, our careers, our family, our lives, that we forget why we were saved in the first place? That it was just some luck of the draw, or that God in his sovereignty and his providence, yeah, yeah, he picked me. It seems like a lot like Red Rover, Red Rover in the playground, you know, and, and if you never got dared over, you felt there was something wrong with you. Election is a difficult doctrine for sure. But what about us today? We've gone through a long period where in many ways we have thought that faith could be lived quietly and it generally fit quite well into the world in which we lived. Harmony and getting along were highly prized in America, particularly here in America. Many religions wanted to reassure the general populace that our faith in no way hindered us from being full participants in the American scene so that we could fit right in and be just like everyone else with the election of the first even Catholic president. We could say that we had finally made it, been finally accepted, and, and there was a movement that, 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 that all religions led to heaven. Remember 911 Yankee Stadium? I think I counted 15 different religions that were all supposedly coming together in some ecumenical movement of we're all on the same page. Folks, we're not all on the same page. Doctrine is everything. How you believe, what you believe is everything. If somebody says Jesus Christ is not God, that's everything. If people say that Jesus wasn't born of a virgin, that's everything. We have to have sound doctrine so that we can stand firm on what we believe and why we believe it. So the culture was in despair back then as it is today. Now they had a fairly wide moral consensus rooted in Judeo-Christian vision. But having finally made it, like many in America today, we assumed room temperature and the fire of our distinctively religious culture faded away. And at some time, Western culture has also largely died. Is that a coincidence? Now we're coming full circle where we've got to rediscover how revolutionary our faith truly is in a world that's gone mad. Y'all, I used to think going to Walmart was like going to Mars. I don't know if you know, there's some strange people that, that go to Walmart. So strange that there are actually sites you can visit on people that walk into Walmart. I, I mean, I, I don't know if it's me or not, but I, I, it just seems like people are getting crazy and weird. And strange. But if I imagine that there are people that really don't know Jesus Christ, then what are they going to do? 
How are they going to get through and navigate through pandemics? You see, if we consider what Paul and Silas were beaten in prison for, they ate away their prophets. Paul just simply delivered a terrible demon out of a slave girl. People exploit that all the time. Her slaveholders profited. In the world today, there's a lot of trafficking of children in sin and, and, and addictions that take place and you know, all of the, the, the prostitution and the drugs and the alcohol and, and Florida still leads the way in child trafficking. There's a lot of money to be made in selling pornography to sex addicts and others. You see, Hollywood always says sex sells. Movie producers, contraceptionists, pimps, escort services, abortionists, and even traffickers in the sex slave industry feed at the trough. Drugs and alcohol are big money makers too, not to mention the huge numbers of products that are sold using the demon of fear. You're not pretty enough. You're not healthy enough. You're not getting old, or you are getting old. You, didn't, you don't drive the car right. You haven't impressed your friends enough. You need to buy our product. It needs to have a swoosh on it. It needs to have a guy on a horse with a polo stick on it. Therefore, the demon of fear and low self-esteem is exploited along with the demon of greed. And they are all alive in this country, every one of them. But what would happen if the church were to start effectively preaching unabridged Christianity? What would happen to the church? What would happen to you if you made an irrevocable commitment to God that you were going to be in his will, and if necessary, a spokesperson for him? What if you didn't have to be afraid of your health or your age or what people think of you? You can find serenity and salvation in Christ so you won't need all that extra alcohol and those drugs. And you could be set free from depression and defeat and discouragement and enslavement to sex. Take authority over your passions and discover the beauty of traditional marriage. What if we got back to the business of driving out demons? Now that freaks people out. We call that Pentecostalism. But yet the Apostle Paul just did it. He recognized the spirit that was tormenting that girl. I'm not sure how many Christians today can recognize a spirit of torment or something in somebody. We just say, oh, I feel sorry for them. But how many take authority as men and women of God in the spirit of Christ to help them be free of that? If Paul did not come by and wasn't led by the Holy Spirit of God to deliver this slave girl, who knows where her life would have ended up? That's real biblical Christianity. It's real. It didn't go away. Because we're the modern contemporary America of 2021. It's real. And what if there's somebody depending on you that knows you're a Christian? That is battling. Depression is a spirit. Alcoholism is a spirit. Drugs is a spirit that consumes this planet. It's real. The answer would be, I'm sure, that we, like Paul, would be and are under attack. Are you really trying to be a threat for God, or are you really just trying to survive? Are you trying to slip under the radar? I've answered that question many times in my head based on these pastors and what they're going through. But they were considered worthy to go through that. I just find it amazing that no other faith is being attacked. Are we the real deal? Are we true believers in Jesus Christ? You see, only you and God can answer that. I think, honestly, that we will only be effective if we preach the unabridged faith like Paul and Silas. Not the faith that is trimmed and tucked under worldly priorities, the faith that insists on being realistic 
It makes endless apologies to the inevitable objections of the world. No matter how much we water things down, the true faith is revolutionary in the freedom it offers from sin and demonic oppression. It has been a pandemic in domestic violence through this virus. Paul and Silas didn't end up in prison by preaching a watered down, tamed and domesticated moral vision. They unabashedly drove out a demon that was afflicting a girl and in so doing they engaged in a revolutionary threat to a world that profits well on sin and their ruler, Satan, found them a viable threat. The question is, are we a viable threat to the darkness? Are we nominal Christians just trying to skate by, occasionally visit a church? Maybe we'll do a devotion, not Bible study, we'll just do devotions. Devotions aren't Bible studies. It's great to start your thought, but it's, there's nothing that substitutes a good Bible study. And I'm so thankful for guys like Mark Brown and Guy Kerr that are teaching the Sunday school every week good, solid, biblical lessons. Try it out. Are you doing a good, solid Bible study at home? Wonderful if you are. But the main thing was they threatened the power of the prince of the air. Calling Jesus Lord was and is a revolutionary threat to the incumbent power which seeks and demands our first and full loyalty. And therefore today, many strive to make different religions fit into neat political categories. And look, guys, I, I, don't, I don't pay attention to politics and do all those things. Both Republicans and Democrat, Democrats are wrong in a lot of accounts. It doesn't mean anything to me. I just, I just think there's two types of people, saved and unsaved. Are you saved or are you unsaved? I could care less what art you look at or what your hobby is. Whatever it is that you do, it doesn't matter. I don't care even how you vote. But I am concerned if you're going to be in heaven or hell. And we should be concerned if our neighbors are in heaven or in hell. I don't know about you, but I just buried one up in West Virginia. And 100% of the time, folks, everybody at a funeral wants to believe that that person in that casket is in heaven. I've never heard anybody in 35 years of ministry say, well, yes, they're in hell. But I always have the privilege when I do funerals, I walk around anonymously, kind of autonomously in the room. And I listen to conversations. You wouldn't believe the things I hear. In the end, the church will not just fit into some neat political category, guys. You do know that, don't you? If Satan is the prince of the power of the air, and he is, and he's been given certain authority over the earth, and he has, his goal is to shut down Christianity. Are you hearing me? True faith is too revolutionary to fit in some worldly box. There's a lot of hatred and anger directed at the church. The political arena says some are too liberal. Some say we're too conservative. More and more we're being shown the door, kicked to the curb, being laughed at and ridiculed. Oh, you Christians. Oh, you Christians. Oh, you Christians. Because Jesus is Lord, not the federal, state, or local government. Jesus Christ is not a Republican or a Democrat, a conservative or a liberal. He is God. And the faith he announces cannot be defined down or, or compromised to fit into a friendship with this world. It won't happen. It can't happen. No tame, domesticated Christianity will threaten or change this world. Let me say that again. No tame or domesticated Christianity will threaten 
or change this world. When Paul preached the gospel, people rioted. But too much modern preaching incites only yawns and indifference. What do we take away? What do we learn from Paul, his arrest at Philippi? That true faith is revolutionary and threatens the world right where it hurts, in the profit and in the power centers. What do you think big tech is all about? Faith? Money, power, greed, it's all there. But I love the fact that we have a hero. And I have a movie clip for you today. Let me set it up. Whether you watched it or not, I'm not a big proponent of Hollywood. It's The Matrix. There's a scene in The Matrix where Neo is shot and killed. He dies. Trinity is having a conversation through love. And so metaphorically for me, it's the power of love and thinking about our Jesus and those things. And when I watch Lord of the Rings, my kids will tell you, I always equate God into all those things. You know, um, you know, Gandalf on the hill, he says, you know, I will arrive not late or too early. I'll arrive exactly on time. When the sun comes over the hill, he's in a white robe and a white horse. So I want you to see this. If you're ready, Miss Jaileen, cue that and, and we'll talk about this. So where he had to, Neo had to enter a world of machines and destroy the work of Mr. Anderson, which is symbolic to me of the devil. Jesus Christ, who created the world, enters the world as the God-man, destroying sin and death, destroying the darkness. He is the light of the world. It was just simply a trigger for you to think about whose you are. In Sunday school, we had three and a half pages of who we are in Christ Jesus. Why am I telling you that? Because listen, you will not survive the onset of what's coming in this world if you don't know who you are and if you don't know whose you are. You must know who you are in Christ. You must know everything that Christ imparts to you and me. Why? Because when you know that, no heights, no depths, no powers, no wars, no pestilence, no famines can touch you. Paul knew who he was in Christ, and so did Silas. MacArthur knows who he is in Christ. Pastor Coates knows who he is in Christ. Do you know who you are? That is everything for your life and your thriving. And the way you finish well is know what Christ did for you on that cross. Know exactly what he paid for in full, that your sanctification is progressive and you are working your way home with Christ. The fact that you were born again by faith why is it now that the Galatians would argue, and Paul wrote to the Galatians, that you try to do it in the flesh? You can't. That's silly to do it that way. You started with faith. You started with the Holy Spirit. You started with God. What did you need to take over? Rest in Him. Know who you are. When you know that, and when you draw near to Him, and you covet in prayer, and you read that Bible, not because you have to, because you get to, you don't pray because you have to. You get to pray. You get to go in the throne room of God. You don't have to go to an archangel or the fifth in command. You get to go. I get to go in the very presence of God Almighty because we have been filtered through the blood of Jesus Christ. There's nothing more powerful than that. You have a voice that God wants to hear from. Oh, that we would all have that kind of faith that these men did. Amen? That's why we come to this table today. It's to celebrate who we are in Christ. Do you know? Do you know? Because you're invited to come to this table and we celebrate this. 
once a month. Bible doesn't give a, a specific time or a number. It just says, as much, do this as much as you want to, remembrance of me. What are we remembering? That he conquered the world. That he conquered sin. If they can send a million Mr. Andersons, they ain't going to stand up to my Jesus. It's not going to happen. The victory's already won. He ascended through the realm of the prince of the power of the air. And all demons and rulers and authorities, all they could do was watch. What did they watch? Him take his place right next to the Father on the throne. Who's in control? Not the governments. Hello? Not the states. Who's in control? God is in control. Amen? God is in control.